Well, welcome to the Ignite at Mentoring series. My name is Robert Pears. I want to share with you something uh, regarding the secret place. I've done many, many videos and I pray they have ministered to you, but I keep getting asked, can I simply explain how to enter? And so I'm going to do three tapes. This first video is the three simple steps that you can take to come in and enter the secret place. Then I want to do another one, a follow-up, the three steps that you can take to make it your permanent dwelling place. And then finally, the third one will be the three simple things that happen as a consequence of making the secret place your abiding place. So stay with me. In this episode, I'm going to share insight from Smith Wigglesworth. And I pray that his quotes will bring clarity and help you understand. And I thank you, Father, we just come because your word declares in John 17 that eternal life is that we might know you. And that bottom line is what it's all about, that we might know you individually, that we might come and have that experiential uh, communion, fellowship with you. Father, we are missing. We are lacking without you. Jesus, you are everything to us. Holy Spirit, come and give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And let this word, Father, be such a word that it ministers to each person, no matter where they're at, that it would encourage and that it would cause, Father God, breakthroughs. It would cause people to come into a real intimate, real relationship with you through Christ. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Now, we are building upon Psalm 91, and it reads, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, we throughout the series have talked a lot and tried to expand upon this, but I want you to get the understanding that God is calling you through the finished work of the cross to come. You and I were created unlike anything else. God said, let there be, and there was. But when it came to mankind, He took and He made us. And then He breathed into us, and we became spiritual beings. We are not just simply a soul, where we're dictated to by our mind, our will, and our emotions like animals. But you are a spirit being. However, since the fall, Man has abided in spiritual death. But through Christ, through the finished work, through Jesus, everything was completed on the cross. Everything that brings you access to the Father was done on the cross. And it's through that sacrifice, through the cross, that you are enabled to come. And it is through that sacrifice that you, as you receive Jesus, you are made spiritually alive again. You were created to a fellowship. You were created to have dominion by being under His dominion. And that's where we see that we abide under His shadow, under His authority. It restores you back into the position that He created and called you to walk with. Now, entering in, as I said, is through that work of the cross, through what Jesus did. And it is by faith. It is not by feeling. It's not by what you see, and you cannot earn it. You simply come as you are, trusting and believing in Jesus and His Word. In And the first step that I want to share is that it's all about love. In Psalm 91, verse 14, it says, Because He has loved me. We also read in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen, nor ear heard, Neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, we cannot even begin to imagine all the things that he has in store for us. But as you come into the secret place, you are going to discover it's about love. Smith Wigglesworth said this, I pray, God, that there may be within us a deep hunger and thirst with the penetration which is centered entirely upon the axle of him, for surely he is all in all. As you come into the secret place, we've seen the image, and I've tried to paint this, that you have to look at the temple or the tabernacle. There are three chambers. 
You must go through the outer, the inner, but then to get into the Holy of Holies, there's the veil. That veil, there is no doorway through. So it's completely opposing and blocking you from that place where the presence dwells. And so we have been stopped, hindered, and many believers have remained in the uh, inner, sorry, the inner court where they can hear him. They have a knowledge of him, but they never press in to really know him. And eternal life is that we might know him, truly know him. We come, and as you come in, it is through Jesus. He tore the veil through the cross and gave you access through his blood. So you don't come. You cannot earn this. You cannot come on the day where you are perfect, just like salvation. It is part of salvation. See, we think that somehow we cannot come in that place until we reach some level of holiness. But it is through Jesus, through surrendering and allowing Him to do a work in us, that we are brought in. And in the Holy of Holies, in the secret place, as we discover in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you are changed from glory to glory. The secret place is all about His love. God so loved that He gave. And as you come into the secret place, we know in the Old Testament days that the blood was shed and it was sprinkled on the mercy seat, the top of the ark, which is in the Holy of Holies. So as you come in, you are painfully aware of His love, and it becomes personal. And this is one of the things I want you to get a hold of when we talk about love. God wants us to separate from the crowd and come as an individual. See, as you go from the outer court, you have the crowds. Then there's less people in the inner court. But coming into the Holy of Holies, it's personal. It's one person. And this is where we come to know Him personally. And we come because He loves us. And out of that love, we love Him. And we become, as you enter, more and more aware of His love for us. It has to wreck you. It has to change you. It has to scar you. It is fully based on that motivation that, God, you are my all in all. A lot of time, our whole Christian life is built upon our time at church. That's our prayer time. That's our Bible study time. And I'm not knocking that because we need church. However, God wants you as an individual to come and seek His face because you love Him when nobody else is around. Intimacy, if you are you know, married or such like, you will know that intimacy occurs when nobody's around. And we need to come when nobody's around and Jesus, I want to know you. I want to have fellowship. I want to open up my heart. And it's in the secret place, as you will discover, it's a safe place because it's built on love. And love demands vulnerability. And that place where He has become vulnerable to you through the cross, we can now become vulnerable and open up and say, you are my all in all. I love you, Jesus. It is not complicate, complicated or difficult. I simply come because I love you. And I want you to know, Jesus, that I am in love with you. And it's demonstrated that when there's no peer pressure, I'm not doing something to be seen by man. I am doing this simply because of you. I'm going after you, Jesus. Smith said this, Oh, to be left alone, alone with God. And most of us hate being left alone. And in part because you were designed for fellowship. But the first fellowship you need, the fellowship that will make you complete, is with Him. When God created Adam, the first person he met was the Lord. When God created Eve, the first person she met was the Lord. And we were created that the first person you would have fellowship is with the Lord. And you are never alone because He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's calling you out of His love because He sees you and He has accepted you. You are precious in His sight. He paid the price and would have done it just for you. That call to come and He wants you out of love to come in that He may love upon you.
And now our worship, our desire, our prayer changes because it's out of a love, not out of a list. Again, many people behind the scene, their prayer life is simply a prayer list, a formulated prayer sheet. I'm not knocking that, but there's something more powerful when we come out of intimacy and just love. If you have somebody you love, your husband, your wife, or somebody that you're in love with, you will know that rich love is demonstrated in spontaneous, real words that come from the heart, that explain and reveal the very thoughts of the heart. And that's what happens in the sacred place. I come not with a formulated prayer, but I come as I am in simplicity, with love, wanting to be alone with him, that I may pour out my love on him. He has become my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Smith said this, we must not look at the things that have done, have, have done in the past. We must look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We must run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus. It's not about what you've done, good or bad. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, good or bad. I have fixed my eyes on Jesus out of love. He is my all in all. When you do that, you'll discover the secret place is not as much a particular place, but a position. Now, some people will criticize me because I refer to it as the Holy of Holies, but there is no Holy of Holies. The temple is gone. However, you are still given access to the Holy of Holies spiritually. Now, if the temple was around today, you still would not have access because of religious rules. However, you have access to the Holy of Holies spiritually anytime, any place. Now, it starts by what you do behind the scenes, but then you come into this place where just like with somebody that you love, you can at any moment even during a conversation with somebody else, go off almost like into this daydream where you were caught up in that person. And we can enter this place where at any moment, any place, we enter in that place, caught up, consumed in Him. Step number two is we need to recognize we need Him. That sounds obvious, but most of us don't because we are trained on this earth to survive of the fittest, not to admit weakness, and find a way. Smith Wigglesworth said, It is to have a clear knowledge that you are powerless to manage, but a rest of faith, knowing God is near at hand to deliver all the time. When you come to that place where you face, particularly when we face challenges that are simply too big, too great, then you start to realize, I need you. And we talk about the story in some of the videos that I've done, Jacob, because Jacob was a great example of a man who saw himself as self-sufficient, a good man trying to do good things. He had, and he wanted the uh, inheritance and he went after that inheritance, but you see that he's a weasel. You see that he's a, you know, he does all these corrupt and bad things. And many of us are like that for many years. The Lord came to me and said to me, you are to me like a David." And I said, that's awesome, but you're also like a Jacob, and I don't like that. But see, in the secret place, when we come recognizing we need him, God doesn't leave you as you are, but God wants to change you as we'll discover later. He wants to take you as a Jacob and make you an Israel, but you have to first recognize your need. The same thing he says to the church uh, in Revelation, that is in Laodicea. The Laodiceans thought they were rich. They thought they had arrived. They thought they were doing it all right. And the Lord says, I know your deeds. They're neither hot nor cold. So they weren't bad, but they weren't on fire from this intimate relationship out of the secret place. But they didn't recognize that they were naked. They were wretch. And God tells them, come by from me. And so when we realize you need him, you absolutely need him. You cannot do it in and of yourself. Let me share this from Smith Wigglesworth. 
We are occupied too much with things of time and sense. We need to spend time alone in the presence of God. We need to give God much time in order to receive new revelations from Him. We need to get past all the thoughts of earthly matters that crowd in so rapidly. If He, if he would only deal with us as He dealt with Jacob, then we should have power with Him and prevail. It takes time. We want an instant result. But see, when you come because you love, and when you recognize you need, a holy desperation consumes you, and a first love overtakes you, so that you are clinging to Him, you're going after Him, and you will not give in or stop. There's an earnest pursuit. We know from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that He is, and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so he makes promise, not just there, but multiple times in the Word, that if we would come to him, if we will seek him, earnestly seek him, we see this even in Proverbs 8, that this pursuit will prove fruitful, that we will have this encounter with him. God wants to meet with you. God has an appointment with you in the secret place. You have a divine invitation to come, and you have a divine appointment with Him. And He wants you to come, and as we'll discover in the next tape, to make this place not just something where you visit, have an experience, but you stay and make it your permanent dwelling place. So we come initially because we need Him. Smith said this, God means to have a people who are broken. The divine power can only come when there is an end of our self sufficiency. But when we are broken, we must hold fast. If we let go, we shall uh, fall short. And often it's when we come to that place where we're in such a trial or difficulty, where we realize we can't do it, that we either run to Him or from, or from Him. There has to be a real pursuit. And you don't have to wait till there's a real trial. You can come if we allow the Holy Spirit to give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. That was the first command given to the Jews, is that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. That they were to get such a revelation of having eyes to see, ears to hear. And I so encourage you every day to pray that. God, give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. I want to see things, not from the natural, but from the spiritual perspective, that I may see things from your perspective, recognizing my absolute need of you. And you'll discover that He has prepared before you a table that overflows. He is inviting you to come to the resources of heaven where every one of your needs is met. This is the place where so many of our solutions, there are so many things that we're desperately really needing are met in Him in the secret place. Number three, we come because we want Him. Now, we've understood that we come out of we love Him, and we need Him. But there has to be more. You have to want Him. We're not coming simply, and maybe you've had children, uh, you'll have that same thing where your children, they come to you only when they need you. God is looking for a people that want Him, a people that are clinging, pursuing Him, hungering and thirsting after Him, desiring His righteousness. So many things could be changed if we lay hold of that. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. We are always focused on the things first, and a lot of time our relationship with the Lord is based on the things and not Him. If you will change your priorities so that He is your priority, not the thing, because when He becomes the priority, He's able to meet all these things. And the key real needs are met, which are in you. Smith Wigglesworth said, Can you hold on to God as did Jacob? You certainly can if you are sincere, if you are dependent, if you are broken, if you are weak. It is when you are weak that you are strong, which of course is 2 Corinthians 12.10.
But if you are self-righteous, if you are proud, if you are high-minded, if you are puffed up in your own imagination, you can receive nothing from Him. And it takes that place where we are willing, if necessary, for Him to correct us, for Him to rebuke us. Because whatever He does, it's always out of love. He's not going to condemn you. And many of us have stayed away out of fear, but His perfect love casts away all fear. Because in His love, there is no judgment. And as you will learn in the series, that He calls you, as you see in 1 John 4, um, that we might know Him and get to know His love and believe in that love. He wants you to taste and see and experience that love and as a consequence, become convinced, persuaded, strong. We know from Ephesians 6 that that we're told to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Have a strong relationship. Have a strong knowledge of His character, His heart, His thoughts. Um, and when we do so, it enables us to run this race with strength. God wants you to come because you so desire Him. You thirst. Smith said this, The human spirit, when perfectly united with the Holy Spirit, has but one place and that is death, death and a deeper death. The human spirit will then cease to desire to have its own way, and instead of my will, the cry of the heart will be, Thy will, O Lord, be done in me. Now, that sounds kind of strange, but as you come in, no flesh can glory in the secret place. No flesh can boast. The flesh, the old you, has to die. So many of us, what hinders us, what becomes the veil, is your hurts, your emotions, your feelings, your demand for your rights, uh, your demands for justice. And some of it may be legitimate. All those things stand in the way when they are boasts and things of the flesh. You have to know that you can trust Him, that He will vindicate, that He is the righteous judge, and that He is good. And that when you cast that thing onto Him, He is able. Now, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's something else. Those things can create veils, not by God, but we. We cause those things to come and rise up as a veil, hindering our entrance. We do know that there's certain laws. For example, if you do not forgive, you're not forgiven. And so unforgiveness, bitterness, and many other things will keep you out of the secret place. When I recognize, I want you, Father. It has to be greater than my wanting of my rights, the wanting of my justice, the wanting even of my own vision, uh, my own dreams, money, any earthly thing. All these things are temporal, and we are now called not to walk as natural people, dictated to uh, by our mind, our will, and our emotions, but people that are spiritual, that we are led by and walk in the Spirit. When we yield to the Spirit, the fruit begins to manifest in our life. And I will talk about in the series, if you listen to it, that the fruit is the outflow of dwelling in the secret place. So many things, as you spend more time in the secret place, become outflows. That change in your life. As you come in, and I've talked about this, you see the price paid. You see the blood shed. And you see that He cares for you. When you see that care, and you see His faithfulness, and you start to come into this place of fellowship, you are now able to cast off fully that care, that worry, that burden, that demand for justice, all those things that you held on to. Because if you continue holding on tightly in your hands, what you hold on to in your hands prohibits God pouring into your hands. And the reason we don't give over is because there are things so dear to our heart. But I want you to get such a revelation that out of His love, as you come and you just want Him, trust Him, you will find that He is a great God. He is a good God. He doesn't play games. He has seen every tear that you've shed. He is fully aware of the brokenness of your heart. And He doesn't want to just sympathize with you. He wants to 
heal you, restore you, and lift you up. He wants to do something bigger in you, greater in you than what you can imagine. Those that learned to abide in the secret place became not just ordinary people, but extraordinary. Every one of the apostles, for example, they were nothings and nobodies. But through that encounter and learning to abide in the secret place, they turned the known world upside down, not just in their generation, but in every generation since. And God wants to do something so big through you that we can't even begin to imagine if we will simply learn to trust. And that's going to mean that we want Him more than these other things. I hunger and thirst for you. Smith said this, and this is where I'll finish in this one. So hunger, sorry, so hungry, so thirsty, that nothing will satisfy us but seeing Jesus. Getting more thirsty every day, more dry every day until the floods come and the master passes by, ministering unto us and through us and through us the same life, the same inspiration that as he is, so too are we in this world. It sounds almost strange that we are to come, all who are thirsty, and drink and be satisfied. And there's a place where we come and we are content. But once you taste and see, you always want more. There's always a pressing on. And so I am satisfied, but I want more of you, God. I am no longer thirsting to that degree, but I want more. And so a new thirst grows that every day there's always a now, that every day today I want to be found in you. And so as I finish, I want you to get the importance is that it has to be something every day. It's not something that you do once. It's not something that you experienced yesterday and it was good. Every day of your life is always now. And every day is the day of salvation. Every day you have to choose. Every day you have to come. Because love, if it's to flourish, depends on a now fellowship. If you are married and the last time you had really good fellowship was 20 years ago, I'm wondering about the state of your marriage. We know that in the natural. We've got to understand that Jesus is available and wants this relationship to grow every day, to go to greater intensity. But how much do you want it? He is not holding back, but he's calling to us. And how much do we want every day to press in? It is by faith. You don't go by what you feel or what you see. So maybe you come in and today nothing happens. I didn't feel anything. I didn't see anything. But remember, he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So you don't stop. And you give him much time. You allow him the time to do a work in you. Because if you will do, I guarantee you, you will find things begin to change. And you are now beginning to abide in the secret place. I pray this message has been simple and yet deep and blessed you and has ministered to you right where you are at. My heart's desire is to see every backslider brought back and having an intimate relationship with Jesus. My desire is that every believer would grow in their fire of the Lord, would grow in their passion to live boldly for Jesus in this hour, and that we would step up and fulfill the, the commission that we've been given and preach this gospel and see disciples one for Jesus. I believe that we're living in the last days, and I believe he's coming soon. But I also believe that we are to occupy till he comes. And I know by the Spirit that I have been commissioned to stir and to see as many people experience him as their living hope every day. I pray this message blessed you. I pray this message has ministered to you. And I just want you to know that we are praying for you. And I'm standing in the gap that every day that you would experience more of him. Whatever assignment of the enemy has against you, that you would discover those decrees were nailed to the cross and in Jesus. As you come into the secret place, you will discover as the Holy Spirit begins to share with you that you are more than a conqueror in him. Amen.
There's so much I'm going to share and I look forward to the next episode. Check out the series on the secret place. There are many videos and we're going to slice it in so many ways. And I pray that they bring to you different depths and understandings to bless you, minister, help you, grow up spiritually, and be a strong and bold believer in Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Be blessed. Be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.